Okay, so last class meeting on uh, Monday, we talked about the cell theory. And uh, it's, uh, we actually first mentioned the cell theory all the way back on, uh, I believe it was, it was in section A on page A4. Um, I'm sorry, A2. A2, we mentioned the cell theory on page A2. So uh, we said that uh, basically the cell is the basic unit of life. And the question that we left off with on Monday is why are cells so small? Cells do grow bigger, but they only grow so big and then they stop growing any larger. What's stopping cells from growing even larger than they are? Now, on page uh, E2, well, I, so right after page E2, there's a, an E2I. Now, you actually have this already, but I just passed it out to you. So the page that I just passed out to you looks exactly like what I'm showing you right now. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. <laughs> if it says B2, I just wrote the wrong letter. Don't worry about it. All right, so you have... And the only difference between the one that you have in your lecture outline and the one that I passed out to you is the one that I passed out to you already has this writing on it. And the one that came with your lecture outline doesn't have this writing on it. Now, here's, let me begin by just showing you this picture. All right. So again, whether you're looking at the picture of uh, the page that you have in your lecture outline or the one that I passed out today, either one. All right, so here's what it's showing. It's showing a cell that grows and grows larger. And instead of this cell growing larger yet, instead it does one of two things. It either just stops growing and doesn't grow any larger, or it divides into two small cells that are the same size as this. And then these two cells will just start to grow until they reach that size. And our question is, what's stopping that cell from growing larger? Why does there seem to be a limit to how large a cell can grow? That's their question. To help answer that question, first let's understand some concepts. This is a cell. And uh, the cell is, uh, uses various nutrients in order to stay alive. Uh, and uh, it also, in, in staying alive, generates various waste products. So this is true at the cellular level. And since we, as, uh, uh, as humans, are just made up of about 60 trillion cells, it's true at the macroscopic level. We need nutrients in our diet because the cells of our body need these nutrients. And we eliminate various waste products. Why? Where do these waste products come from? They were produced by the cells that make up our body. So let's identify some of these nutrients because we've already learned them uh, back in, as our, in our review of biological chemistry. So uh, cells, all living cells, need uh, chemicals including oxygen and glucose. We're going to be learning that what cells use, oxygen and glucose, which is a sugar, what they use them for is a process called cellular respiration. We've actually mentioned that a word by name last class meeting when we talked about, are you ready? ATP. ATP will come up every single class for the rest of the semester. ATP is a high energy nucleotide we talked about last time and we said that the way that our cells of our body make this gasoline called ATP is by breaking apart sugars, foods, including sugars, with oxygen uh, in a process called cellular respiration to make that gasoline called ATP. We're going to be learning a lot more about this cellular respiration process. Now, as uh, cells uh, use oxygen and sugars to make ATP, they generate a waste product called carbon dioxide, or CO2. Now, how does the oxygen and glucose get into the cell? It has to go into the cell through the surface cell membrane. The cell membrane is the outer surface of the cell. And how does the carbon dioxide get out of the cell? It has to move across that outer surface, that cell membrane. What other nutrients do cells require? Cells need amino acids. We talked about amino acids over the last couple of class meetings, and we know that amino acids are used as the building blocks to manufacture proteins. 
And so these amino acids have to get into the cell through that cell membrane, and then they are joined together to form these uh, chains of amino acids that then become coiled up and are known as proteins. Interestingly, we're also going to be learning that not only do the cells of our body manufacture new proteins all the time, the cells of our body break down old proteins. And when the cells of our body break down old proteins, they form waste products called ammonia and urea. So these waste products have to get out of the cells across the cell membrane, just like carbon dioxide is a waste product that has to get out of the cells. Now it happens to be that we exhale this waste product called carbon dioxide uh, out our lungs. Uh, and the way that we get rid of <clears throat> the, the, uh, the way that we get rid of ammonia and urea, is not by exhaling it out of our lungs, but actually peeing it out in our urine. So that's, uh, those are waste products that appear in our urine. But again, where did they come from? Where did ammonia and urea come from that comes out in our pee or our urine? It, it comes from, uh, it's made by the cells of our body as they break down old proteins. We've also learned last class meeting that uh, nucleotides are used by cells. You'd say, for what? Nucleotides are joined together in a precise sequence, sequence to form nucleic acids, including DNA and RNA. But not only do cells manufacture new nucleic acids from nucleotide nutrients, but they break down old nucleic acids into a waste product called uric acid. So uric acid is a waste product formed from the breakdown of old DNA and RNA that is also peed out or excreted in our urine. Now, uh, we haven't yet talked about vitamins and minerals yet. We will be. Uh, but we're going to be learning that vitamins and minerals are other nutrients that are required in our diet. And they largely function in a role known as coenzymes. They act as coenzymes inside cells. And uh, we know that, uh, after all, all living things are mostly made out of water. A human is 60% water. A cell is 80% water. So we know that water goes into cells and water goes out of the cells. And that's mostly what makes up the inside of a cell is water. So these are some of the nutrients that we need. And with the exception of oxygen, which we inhale, through our mouth and our nose into our lungs, and that's how it gets into our body, uh, all, all these others are ingested, and they are found in the foods that we eat. So when you eat that hamburger, french fries, and chocolate malt, or Coca-Cola, it's all digested into these nutrients, and what we actually absorb into our body and make available to the cells of our body are sugars and amino acids, nucleotides, vitamins, and minerals and water so that the cells can carry on these processes. And uh, how do these nutrients get into the cells? By moving across the cell membrane, the outer surface. We've also now summarized that living cells produce waste products. They, these waste products have to get out of the cell by moving across that outer cell membrane, that outer surface. And uh, most of these waste products we excrete in our urine. Any excess ammonia, urea, uric acid, even water comes out in our urine. Carbon dioxide, though, is exhaled out our mouth. So we're trying to explain why we need certain nutrients in our food, why we need oxygen, and where does carbon dioxide come from, and what's in our pee, what's in our urine. OK, now that we've given you the big picture, let's see if we can come back and answer this question. Why do cells have a limit to how big they can grow? That was our original question. How come they just don't keep growing larger and larger? What's preventing them from growing larger? It basically, the answer to this is the relationship between the surface area of a cell and its volume. Now, by surface area, we mean the surface. How big is the outer surface of a cell? So this arrow for surface area is pointing to the outer surface right here. 
The volume, by volume, we're referring to what's inside the cell. That's what's inside the cell, the internal volume. Now, we have actually formulas that allow us mathematically to calculate the outer surface of a, of a spherical ball-shaped cell. And we have a formula that allows us to calculate the internal volume. Now, the surface area for a three-dimensional cell, three-dimensional ball-shaped cell, is 4 pi r squared. Now, some of you might immediately be thinking, well, wait a second. I can vaguely remember in math class a long time ago learning that the area of a circle is pi r squared. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. All right? And that means that if you knew the radius, which is the distance from the center of a circle to the outer edge, and you, you squared the radius and multiplied times pi, which is 3.14, that would tell you the area of a flat two-dimensional circle. But we're not talking about calculating, we're not talking about calculating the area of a flat circle. We're talking about calculating the area on the outer surface of a balloon or a ball, a sphere. In other words, a cell is three-dimensional and not flat. So the surface area for a three-dimensional ball is 4 pi r squared. Now, the formula for de uh, de calculating the internal volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now, really what the limiting factor is, is going to be the relationship between the outer surface and the internal volume. Now, to keep the math really, really simple, let's try to simplify this. We really just want to compare surface area to volume. Both of these, now surface area it has the number 4 in it. Volume has the number four-thirds. You know what? Those are close enough to being similar that we're just going to ignore them. Both formulas have pi in the formula, 3.14. So let's just ignore them because it appears in both formulas. So fundamentally, the big difference between uh, uh, estimating the outer surface of a cell and its internal volume is that the outer surface is proportional to the square of the radius, that's the radius squared, where, here, whereas the internal volume is proportional to the cube of the radius, the radius times multiplied times itself three times. So that's really the fundamental difference, and yes, I'd like you to know that difference. So let's see what this actually means. Just all we're going to do, we're just going to use r squared and r cubed to estimate the outer surface and the internal volume. Let's assume that the radius of this cell is 1. Now you might say, 1 what? The units don't matter, because as long as we're consistent, it won't matter. It doesn't matter if we're talking about 1 foot, 1 inch, 1 millimeter, 1 micrometer. But if you want to make it realistic, we could say it's about 1 micrometer. But anyhow. It's 1. Now, let's estimate its outer surface and its internal volume. The outer surface is approximately square of the radius. So what's 1 squared? 1. That's 1 times 1. The internal volume is the radius cubed. So what's 1 times 1 times 1? 1. Can it? 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. All right? So, all right? So, the area is 1, the volume is 1. Can everybody see that the numbers are the same? All right, now, let's assume the cell grows larger. All right, so now it's increased in size, and the distance from the center of the cell to its outer edge is 2. Let's estimate its outer surface and its internal volume. So the uh, outer surface is what? It's 2 squared. 2 times 2 is 4. The internal volume is 2 cubed. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Can everybody see that now the internal volume number is bigger than the surface area? So you'd say, yeah, like so what? All right, here's what so what. How do the nutrients get into the cell? Through the outer surface. How do the waste products get out of the cell? Through the outer surface. That means that as this cell is growing, 
its area, its surface area, is not growing as fast as its internal volume. Can everybody follow that? The inside of the cell is increasing at a faster rate than its outer surface. Let's take this one more step. Let's say this cell grows even larger yet. All right, so now it has a radius of four. All right, so let's estimate, let's estimate its outer surface. So what's four squared? 16. And what's 4 cubed? That's 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. Can everybody see that as this cell is growing larger, its internal volume is increasing at a faster rate than its outer surface, right? That's because the internal volume is increasing with the cube of the radius, but its outer surface is only increasing with the square of the radius. That means that the need, the requirement for nutrients inside the cell, its, its need for nutrients is increasing at a faster rate than the ability of the nutrients to enter the cell through its outer surface. So as this cell keeps growing larger and larger, it's becoming more and more disproportionate. The, needs for, the need for nutrients is increasing faster than the ability of the nutrients to get through that outer surface into the cell to keep the cell alive. Furthermore, the production of waste products in the cell is increasing at a faster rate than the ability of the waste products to get out of the cell across that cell membrane. So basically, the cell reaches a certain point, a certain size, where if it grows any larger, it will die because the nutrients won't be able to enter the cell membrane fast enough to keep the inside of the cell alive, and the waste products won't be able to get out of the cell fast enough to prevent this, a, a buildup, an accumulation of waste products that becomes toxic or poisonous to the cell. So the cell basically can only grow so large. At that point, if it grows any larger, it will die, because its surface area isn't big enough to meet the needs of the internal volume. And, and the cell either stops growing or it divides into two small cells. And you'd say, what does that do? Well, once cells are small, haven't we learned that its area is the same as the volume? So therefore, the surface area is at more than sufficient for the nutrients to get into the cell and the waste products to get out of the cell to keep the inside of the cell alive. Does everybody follow that? Now, let's say you don't follow it. It's in the book, chapter 3. All right? So uh, that's the explanation. And so if we return back to page uh, E1, this is basically how I summarized it on page E1. As a cell grows in size, its volume increases faster than its surface area. Because its volume is increasing with the cube of the radius, the surface area is increasing only with the square of the radius. These are the actual numbers if you actually plug them into the formulas. All right. Now, the next thing we want to speak about with cells is that if we look at cells, they f fall into two general categories. Those that have a nucleus and those that lack a nucleus. Those that lack a nucleus are called prokaryotic cells. And these include bacteria and blue-green algae. These are very small cells, very small, simple cells that not only lack a nucleus, but lack most other internal organelles. And these kinds of single-celled organisms that are made up of these very small cells lacking a nucleus are all placed in kingdom monera. We first learned the kingdoms, the five kingdoms, at the end of section B, which we needed to know for the first example. <laughs> Incidentally, the root karyo means nucleus. So prokaryo literally means without a nucleus. The other category is eukaryotic, which means having a nucleus. Karyo means nucleus. So eukaryotic cells are cells that have a nucleus and many other complex internal organelles. These are much larger cells, uh, and in fact, they include the cells of all other living things. The single-celled protists, the multicellular fungi, the multicellular plants and animals are all made up of cells, larger cells containing a nucleus and many, many other complex organelles. 
I think we had mentioned back in section B when we talked about the kingdoms that bacteria are basically the closest living things we know to probably the very first living cells that appeared on the planet. It's believed that the most primitive life forms, the very first living cells that evolved or appeared on the planet Earth, most closely re uh, resemble the bacteria that still live today. Very small, simple cells. Let's take a look at a bacteria, uh, uh, and uh, we made a note to see page E7. So let's look on E7. So on page E7, at the top left, on the top left of E7, so it shows what's labeled a bacterium. You'd say, well, you said bacteria. Well, bacteria is plural, and bacterium is singular. And that's a prokaryotic cell. So what does it basically look like? And again, you've got pictures in color in your book that are much better than these. Basically, it consists of a cell membrane. Here it's labeled bacterial cell or plasma membrane. And uh, surrounding that cell membrane is an outer cell wall. So there's an outer wall surrounding that bacterial cell membrane. Now, the cell wall was made up of a polysaccharide, a complex sugar. You'll notice how we're now going to be using the vocabulary that we learned back in section D on those or organic molecules. We're going to be using that vocabulary to explain how things work in living things. Um, now, inside the bacterial cell is cytoplasm. And we're going to be learning that cytoplasm or protoplasm is mostly water. It's 80% water by weight. And after water, the next major chemical that makes up cytoplasm are proteins. So it's mostly water and proteins. Now, inside this very small, simple bacterial cell is a circular-shaped chromosome. A chromosome is, of course, something made out of DNA. And this is not a nucleus. It's not a structure. It's simply a ring-shaped piece of DNA. It's a DNA <coughs> in the shape of a, a ring. So uh, that's uh, basically what a bacterial cell looks like. Okay, now let's, uh, as far as a eukaryotic cell, shown right below is a eukaryotic cell. Now this happens to be a paramecium. Those of you taking lab will eventually be looking at paramecium under the microscope. And this is a single-celled organism these are not drawn to scale, meaning this bacteria and this bacteria, uh, paramecium are not drawn to scale because the bacteria would be much, much smaller than this uh, uh, pro uh, paramecium. But the paramecium is a single-celled organism, but it's much larger cell than a bacteria, and it's a much more complex cell. It has not only a nucleus, it's got all kinds of other internal organelles, I mean, this is really amazing. It even has what's the equivalent of a mouth within this cell. This is one cell, and even an anal pore through which it eliminates waste. So this is, it's hard to imagine. This is just one cell big, but it's uh, very complex. All right, well, we're going to be learning more about these eukaryotic cells. But let's go back to E1. Back on page E1, we're going to start our examination of cells by examining or considering cell membranes. All right, now whether we're talking about the membrane, the cell membrane of a bacterial cell, or the cell membrane of a, a, a eukaryotic cell, including human cells, it's all pretty much the same. The cell membrane we wrote provides the shape for a cell, and it's said to be semi-permeable. The word semi-permeable means that some things can get through that cell membrane, can enter or leave the cell through that membrane, and other things cannot. It's, it's not permeable to everything. It's permeable to some things, but not permeable to others. So it's semi-permeable. Now, chemically, the cell membrane is made up of a double layer of phospholipid molecules. Now, the word that, that they commonly use is bilayer. Now, if you had a bicycle, how many wheels does a bicycle have? Two. two. And bilayer means two layers. So it's a double layer of phospholipids with embedded proteins. 
to understand this, let's look at page, um, we're going to look at page uh, e, let's see, E8. Yeah, E8. Thank you very much. So on the top of E8, So on the uh, top of E8, let's uh, look at this right up here. Right here on the top left on E8, it shows a cell. That happens to be a eukaryotic cell because I see a nucleus. But it wouldn't really matter because the cell membrane is pretty much the same in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We've already pointed out that the cytoplasm inside of a cell is mostly water by weight. It's about 80% water. So it's mostly water inside of a cell. Now, all living cells, in order to stay alive, they ha can only stay alive if they're surrounded by fluid. So there is fluid on the outside of all living cells. So, for example, a paramecium or an amoeba are single-celled organisms that live in pond water. That's the fluid that surrounds these single-celled organisms. But what about the cells in our body? Do the cells in our body, are they actually surrounded by fluid? And the answer is yes. Now you might say, well, wait a second. Isn't our skin made up of cells? Yes, it is. You'd say, but there's no water. I don't feel any water or fluid on the outside of my skin. So, you know, you said all the cell living cells are made up, uh, have water around them. You're right. These cells are dead. And the reason why they're dead is they're in contact with air. If you've ever scraped your skin, Right? You scraped your arm, you scraped your knee, and you scraped off some of the top dead layers of skin cells that were dead because they were in contact with air. Did you ever see a clear fluid start to ooze? Right? That means you've now scraped off the dead cells and you've reached the layer of living cells. So surrounding all of the living cells in our body is fluid. We call this tissue fluid. Tissue fluid. In fact, if you made an incision and opened somebody's abdomen up, You'd see all this fluid surrounding all the internal organs. If that fluid wasn't there, the cells would all dry up and die. So there is tissue fluid or fluid on the outside of the cell. Now if we magnify, here's the cell membrane. If we magnify this area right here, it'll look like this image right here. This is the cell membrane. Up here, this is the cytoplasm inside the cell, right, which is 80% water. And here on the outside of the cell membrane is tissue fluid, which is similarly 80% water. Looking at the cell membrane, the cell membrane is made up of two layers of phospholipid molecules. Now, we covered phospholipids back in section D. Here's what we learned about phospholipids. We said that each phospholipid kind of looks like a balloon with two strings. You can see that looking right here. And we said that a phospholipid was like a schizophrenic molecule. The balloon part was hydrophilic, meaning it likes water. Hydro means water. The two strings, which, uh, and incidentally, the hydrophilic part of the phospholipid was the part containing phosphate. And the two strings are really two long chains of fatty acids, meaning fats. And fats don't mix with water. Fats are hydrophobic. They hate water. So you'll notice that in looking at this double layer of phospholipids, the inner row, the inner row of phospholipids, the balloon part that likes water, is facing the cytoplasmic water on the inside of the cell. You'll notice that in the outer layer of phospholipids, the balloon part that likes water is facing the tissue fluid on the outside of the cell. And what's in the middle of the cell membrane is a double layer of fat. I always think of this as like an Oreo cookie. Imagine this is a cookie, this is a cookie, and right in the middle is the creamy filling in the middle, which is pure fat. So in this way, a cell membrane effectively separates the fluid on the inside of the cell is separated from the fluid on the outside of the cell by this double layer of fat, because water and fat don't mix. So that effectively creates a separation, a partition, between the cytoplasmic fluid on the inside and the fluid on the outside of the cell. 
Now, what is also shown in this picture are embedded proteins. So I kind of colored them in red. They're not really red. But anyhow, uh, there are various proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Proteins are very important in terms of how living cells and living things work. Uh, one of the most important roles of proteins, we talked about uh, a last class meeting or the meeting before, and that's as enzymes. So some proteins function as enzymes. We defined an enzyme as a protein that catalyzes a biochemical reaction. It causes chemical reactions to occur. Some of these enzymes might be facing towards the cytoplasmic side of the cell membrane, or they might even be sticking out on the outer surface of the cell membrane. Some of these proteins act as ion channels, ion channels. This particular protein right here, right, it's labeled a channel. It's like a tube-shaped protein. It's like a cutaway view. And it looks like it's a tube, shaped like a tube or a pipe that would allow certain chemicals to flow into the cell or maybe out of the cell. In fact, the purpose of these is to allow ions to flow in or out. I'm going to summarize all this in just a moment. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll show you it's all written down in a moment, or I, well, I'll write it down for you. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of these proteins, some of these proteins in the cell membrane act as transporter proteins. I actually have this protein right here labeled a transporter protein. And what transporter or carrier proteins do is they help transport certain larger chemicals like sugars and amino acids into a cell. Chemicals that are too large to easily move through the cell membrane on their own are helped across the cell membrane by these proteins called transporter proteins. Also, Sticking out on the outer surface of the cell membrane are receptor site proteins. Now, to help you visualize this, if we look at this picture here, the point I'm trying to make is there are some proteins sticking out on the outer surface of the cell membrane, and they include, among other things, uh, receptor site proteins. I'll explain what those are in a moment. There's another type of protein also sticking out on the outer surface of the cell membrane labeled recognition site glycoproteins. Now our first thought is, what's a glycoprotein? This in red is the protein, but you'll notice it's labeled, it has carbohydrates, and the word carbohydrate is another word for sugar. So there are carbohydrates or sugars attached to that protein. So when we have a protein with sugars attached to it, it's called a glycoprotein, because the root glyco means sugar. So these act as what are called recognition site glycoproteins, and again, they are located sticking out on the outer surface of the cell membrane. Let me tell you a little bit more about these. All right, so in terms of... Now, you might say, well, where am I supposed to write this? Well, you could write it anywhere you wanted to. You know, you probably have some space on E2II, right? If, uh, right below E2II, you got this blank space right here. And that's probably enough to write where I'm going to write it. All right, so, or you can write it anywhere you want. You can write it on your hand. Uh, the, uh, all right, so, what are the roles of these proteins in the cell membrane? So some of these proteins act as ion channels. Channels, openings, for specific ions to flow through. Now, some examples of ions are sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions, and chloride ions. Have we ever learned about ions? Yeah, we were tested on it on our last exam. An ion is an electrically charged atom. So they're very small. They have an electrical charge because they, they're either metals that gave away an electron, and since it's a positive virtue to give, they became positively charged. Or they are uh, nonmetals, like chloride, uh, which uh, take, are takers of electrons, which is kind of a negative thing to be a taker, so they become negatively polarized. Now, these ion channels are specific. So there are specific sodium ion channels and different potassium ion channels and different calcium ion channels. And these ion channels can open or close. So they can be in an open state or a closed state. Again, these are really proteins. 
that act like a little tube that can open or close, allowing certain specific ions to flow in or out of the cell. Some of these proteins in the cell membrane are called transporter or carrier proteins. They are, help transport sugars and amino acids into a cell. They are specific. The proteins that transport sugars into the cells are different than the proteins that transport amino acids into the cell. So they are specific. Now, if the transporter protein requires gasoline, in order to transport that chemical, uh, then it's called active transport. So for example, in order for the transporter proteins to transport amino acids into the cell, it requires this gasoline called ATP. And since it requires this gasoline called ATP to transport the amino acids into the cell, that's called active transport. Interestingly, the transporter proteins that transport sugars into the cell do not require ATP. Now you might say, I don't even know what the heck you just talked about. Um, I'm busy writing everything else. It's okay, you, you don't have to rush because I'll give you enough time. But let's look at, to help us visualize this, let's just look again on page E8, the same page where our cell membrane was, and let's look uh, in the lower half of page E8. So you'll notice that oh, what it shows on page E8, here it shows an ion channel. Here it shows an ion channel where a little ion can flow through a tube. Now again, these are just electrically charged atoms. And uh, then right here it shows proteins, uh, 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 transporter proteins, and in this Larges. So in this case, it shows a box-shaped chemical attaching to this transporter protein, and it uses gasoline called ATP to transport that box-shaped chemical into the cell. Since it requires gasoline in the form of ATP, this is called active transport. Shown right below it, and that's what amino acid, how amino acids are transported. Shown right below it, it shows a different transporter protein that's transporting a ball-shaped chemical across the cell membrane. But it says no ATP, no gasoline is required. So and that's how sugars are transported across the cell membrane. We're going to have more to say about this, but this is actually described right here where it says certain specific solutes, which means chemicals, can bind to specific protein carriers, which channel them through the membrane by carrier-mediated transport. If the transport is active, that means it requires energy in the form of ATP, or it may be passive, requiring no energy. So to transport amino acids, it requires ATP, active transport. To transport sugars, it does not require energy or ATP. All right, now, back uh, where we're kind of making our list, some of the proteins in the cell membrane act as enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze specific chemical reactions. Also, there are receptor sites. Now, receptor site proteins are really fascinating. You'd say, yeah, sure. Uh, they are actually very interesting. These proteins are located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. And they are, they are specific for certain hormones, neurotransmitters, and drugs. You'd say, what? The purpose of a receptor site is the word receptor is like the same word as to receive. So, in other words, we know that hormones affect our body, right? Just say yes. Okay, hormones affect our body. Haven't we talked about hormones like estrogen and testosterone, insulin, and oxytocin? All right? You need to be learning all those. So these hormones affect our body. Really what we should say is they affect the cells of our body. Now how would a hormone affect the cells of our body? It actually, the hormone attaches to a receptor site, and that's what causes that cell to start doing something differently. So, uh, just to, as a visual aid, let's just again look at this picture here. So if there are these receptor sites 
These receptor side proteins. Yes. Are you returning back to that other page? Yes. If there are these receptor side proteins on the outer surface of the cell, this is where different hormones attach. Now, these receptor side proteins are specific. So some of these receptor sites are insulin receptor sites. Some of them are estrogen receptor sites. Some of them are growth hormone receptor sites. Some of them are oxytocin receptor sites. Some of them are corticosteroid receptor sites. Not every cell in our body has receptor sites for every hormone. So now we start to understand how it's possible that some hormones affect certain cells of our body, but not other cells. For example, estrogen affects a woman's uterus, her womb, and her breasts, but estrogen doesn't affect the heart. Why not? The cells of the uterus have estrogen receptor sites on their outer surface. But heart cells do not have estrogen receptor sites on the outer surface, and therefore estrogen has no effect on heart cells. Does everybody follow that? So cells can have, they might have no receptor sites. They might have one or two different receptor sites to one or two different hormones. They might have 20 different receptor sites, and therefore can be affected by 20 different types of hormones. Now, in fact, not only are there receptor sites for hormones, but there are receptor sites for neurotransmitters and drugs. What's a neurotransmitter? Neurotransmitters are chemicals released by neurons. So we've given you examples of hormones like insulin and estrogen. <clears throat> An example of a, a neurotransmitter, a chemical released by neurons that can affect cells, would be a chemical like dopamine or serotonin, or endorphins. So if you've heard of those, fine, and if you haven't, okay. But these are the names of different chemicals released by neurons. How does serotonin, or dopamine, or epinephrine affect some cells but not other cells? It can only affect those cells that have receptor sites on the outer surface of that cell. Only those cells can, can uh, uh, allow a dopamine to attach and activate a dopamine receptor site on that, of those cells. So we wrote that activation of any receptor site, an insulin receptor site, a dopamine receptor site, a growth hormone receptor site, causes changes in the cell's function. So it starts to do something differently than it did before that hormone or neurotransmitter or drug attached to it. One more thing this helps answer. Over the years, I would have students ask the following question. They would say, uh, uh, Professor Fink, I don't understand. If, if somebody takes a medication for their heart, how does the drug know to go to their heart? The answer is when you take anything and swallow it, it's absorbed into your bloodstream and it carry, it's carried everywhere in your body. But that drug can only affect those cells that have a receptor site for that drug. So if they design a drug that attaches to a receptor site on heart cells, it will only affect heart cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, it, it's carried everywhere. Estrogen is carried in the bloodstream everywhere in the body, but it will only affect those cells of a woman's body that have estrogen receptor sites. It won't affect any cells that don't. Yeah, so that's what's going on. Now, uh, one more role of proteins. Elastral, recognition sites. So what are recognition sites? These are glycoproteins located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. So like receptor sites, these are also located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. Why are they called, well we know why they're called glycoproteins, they are proteins with glucose or sugars attached. Why are they called recognition sites? because they allow your WBCs, you'd say, what's that? White blood cells. They allow your white blood cells to recognize your cells from foreign cells. In other words, the question that we're dealing with right now is the following. When a bacteria enters your body, how does your white blood cells know to destroy the bacterial cell? It somehow has to recognize that a bacterial cell is not one of your, your own cells. 
So the way that your white blood cells are able to do that is that there are these glycoprotein recognition sites, and there's a group of them that are located on the outer surface of every cell in your body. Now, in terms of these glycoprotein recognition sites, every single person has a unique set of glycoprotein recognition sites on the outer surface of the cells, every cell in their body. Unless you have an identical twin. Does anybody have an identical twin in the class? Okay. So unless, in the, with the exception of you then, if your brother is an actually an identical twin, all right, it might be a fraternal twin, then it's not the truth, okay? Because fraternal is no more close, similar than two brothers, all right? But uh, with the exception of identical twins, we'll have, we'll have the exact same recognition site glycoproteins on the outer surface of every cell in their body. There are, there's no other, in terms of the rest of you, there's not a single other person on this planet has, that has the same identical, we could call it license plate, marker, identity markers on the outer surface of their cells. So your white blood cells know what those cell, rec those recognition sites or identity markers are, those license plates. If any cell enters your body and it doesn't have that correct, identical recognition sites, the white blood cell will destroy it because it is viewed as foreign to the body. All right? So these, I, these are really identification markers on the outer surface of the cell that allow your white blood cells to tell the difference between self versus foreign. What's self, what's you, and what's not you, what's foreign. Now, not only would, uh, obviously, if a bacterial cell enters your body, would it not have the correct identification markers, and these recognition sites could also be called cell identity markers or identification markers. <clears throat> not only would the bacteria not have the correct identification markers. What if we transplanted a kidney from one person into another person? Oh. Now that kidney is made up of foreign human cells. But we just said that if, there's no two human, humans that have the exact same identification markers unless you have an identical twin. So ha th what happens is even when they do a transplant, and first of all, before they ever transplant any organ, they will only try transplanting a heart or a kidney if they can find, and here's the expression, a close match. You ever heard that term? A close match. In other words, they analyze those markers on the outer surface of the cells and if they can't find one that's at least a close match, they won't even try to do the transplant. If they can find a close match, and the close match is usually from a relative, because that would be genetically most similar, usually. But anyhow, if they can find a close match, they'll try. Even when they find a close match, your white blood cells are not easily fooled. Because they, are, they still like recognize that that's not a correct match, even though it may be a close match. And they will start to attack the cells of that transplanted kidney. And if they start to destroy that transplanted kidney, that's known as organ transplant rejection. You ever heard that term? Yep. Organ transplant rejection. That means what's causing the rejection is the white blood cells, your immune system. The white blood cells are your immune system. So organ transplant rejection is when the white blood cells attack and destroy the cells, those foreign cells making up that transplanted kidney. They will do that even with a close match. So then how do they get somebody, even with a close match, how do they get that person's body to accept that transplanted organ? And the only way that they can get it is taking drugs. They basically give them drugs called immunosuppressant drugs. Immunosuppressant drugs. Now, you'd say, what does immunosuppressant mean? 
Suppress means to decrease, to inhibit, to inhibit the immune response. What these drugs usually do is they lower the white blood cell count. That's how they work. They lower the white blood cell count and they hinder, they inhibit the immune response. By, uh, by suppressing the immune response, by lowering the white blood cell count, they may be able to get that person's body to not destroy that transplanted organ. Incidentally, the most common drugs that are used for this would be corticosteroids, which I have mentioned. Question. Yep. Is that, is that healthy? Well, if you needed a kidney and would die without it, Yes. If they say, if they're going to give you a choice, they'll say, your kidney is failing. You have six months to live. Do you want to try a kidney transplant? Now, you could say, no, I'd rather just end my life in six months. You're right. You're right. So obviously, what you're one step ahead of me, you're quite right. Obviously, the danger of being on drugs that suppress your white blood cells and immune response makes you more vulnerable to get sick from bacteria and viruses. And commonly, what people end up dying from who've had an organ transplant taking immunosuppressant drugs is something like viral pneumonia. But at least they gave it a try, because otherwise, for sure, they would be dying. All right? If you're somebody's heart is failing, you can't live without a heart. So most people will do, you know, anything basically to see if they can see if that'll work. Yeah. How long do they have to take those drugs to work? Okay, how long do they have to take the drugs? What's the answer? For the rest of their life. The moment they stop taking it, the white blood cell count increases and it starts attacking the organ. So they have to take it for the rest of their life as long as they have that transplanted organ. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but that's only temporary. Yeah, but it's only temporary. You're waiting for that organ. Right. All right, it's just temporary. And in fact, if they can't get an organ transplanted long, uh, soon, uh, that machine won't keep you alive. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Do they do what? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Anything can happen. All right, so uh, th medicine is complicated. So uh, anyhow, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the use of immunosuppressant drugs. Now, uh, one more aspect to this. Some of you may have heard of a class of d uh, diseases that are called autoimmune diseases. Did you ever, have you heard of that word? And if you haven't, you have now. Do you ever think about what it means? What does auto mean? What does auto mean? Yeah. Self. It means self. So you're immune to yourself. In an autoimmune disease, the white blood cells actually attack your own cells. Now, is that supposed to happen? No. no. But they, for some reason, something has gone terribly wrong. And the immune system, or white blood cells, are attacking your own body cells. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples of autoimmune diseases you may have heard of. Rheumatoid arthritis, if you've ever heard of it. That's where the immune system attacks the joints of the body. Another one, rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is where the immune system, the white blood cells, attack the heart. Another example, multiple sclerosis, or MS. Anybody know what the immune system attacks there? The, muscle. the nervous system. So it attacks the nervous system. <clears throat> and I'll give you one last one. Uh, juvenile onset diabetes. In juvenile onset diabetes, the immune system attacks the pancreas that makes insulin. So these are all autoimmune. I could list another hundred. Okay? <laughs> Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, Graves' disease, Hashimoto's disease, uh, uh, lupus erythematosus. Uh, we could just go on and on as far as the number of autoimmune diseases. 
So there, this area, in order to understand autoimmune diseases, there's a lot of research going into what's gone wrong. So one of the current ideas is that for some genetic reason, and they're probably genetic factors, these people are not forming these recognition sites on the outer surface of some of the cells of their body. And since some of the cells in their body lack these recognition sites, these identity markers, on uh, maybe it's in their heart, maybe it's in their nervous system, maybe it's in their muscles, wherever it is, then their white blood cells start to attack their own body in those places where they're lacking those identity markers. So this is an area of intense research. Okay, so we've been talking about, back on page E1, we've been learning about the cell membrane. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, the, what I'd now like to address is, the con uh, is to describe how chemicals can move across the cell membrane. How do they get through that cell membrane? And so chemical substances, or solutes, get across by about four major ways, including diffusion, osmosis, uh, active transport, and phagocytosis. And that's what we're going to look about. Uh, this is covered in chapter four of your textbook. So what is diffusion? Some of you have a lab test in my lab, uh, on my, in my lab class on Friday. We've already learned about diffusion, so this is a review. What is diffusion? Diffusion is the spontaneous movement of a substance, a chemical, down its concentration gradient, meaning it's when a chemical spontaneously starts to flow from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. In other words, if there was a whole bunch of some chemical right here, it tends to spontaneously start to move outwards. Now what's causing it to move is actually because uh, all atoms and molecules vibrate. They are in motion. And because they're in motion, they bump into each other. And wherever they're crowded together, they bump into each other and they start spreading out. Let me give you two quick examples. If, uh, if uh, well, I'll give you one example, anyhow. If we had a bottle of perfume, so there's a whole bunch of perfume molecules inside the bottle. If I take the cap off the bottle of perfume, what do the perfume molecules start to do? They start to diffuse or spread out of the bottle into the air. And they keep spreading more and more, keep diffusing out of the bottle into the air because they're simply flowing from a high concentration in the bottle out into the air where it's a lower concentration. And uh, eventually, we'll smell that perfume everywhere and it'll just get more and more intense as more and more perfume molecules diffuse or spread out. <clears throat> now, uh, in terms of visualizing diffusion, uh, let's look at a, a picture here. Uh, let's take a look at page E9. Page E9. And on the top right on page E9, so on the top right on page E9, you'll notice it shows two cells, and it's actually got a legend labeled diffusion. So in this case, it shows a whole bunch of some sort of chemical on the outside of this cell, and the arrow indicates that it's flowing into the cell. And it's simply flowing from a higher concentration to a lower concentration into the cell. An example of a chemical that easily diffuses into a cell is oxygen. Oxygen is a very small molecule, it's just two atoms big. On the other hand, right next to it, it shows a cell where there's a whole bunch of some sort of chemical on the inside of the cell, and it's diffusing out of the cell, going from a higher concentration inside to a lower concentration on the outside. An example of a chemical that is constantly diffusing out of the cell is CO2, carbon dioxide. It's constantly being produced as a waste product in cellular respiration inside the cell, and it's constantly diffusing or flowing out. So diffusion is just this spontaneous flow of a chemical in or out of the cell, just spreading, uh, going from an area of higher to lower concentration. Now, there are uh, four factors that I'm going to give you that affect the rate of diffusion. Let's go back to E1. I'm going to come back to E9 in a moment, but back on E1. 
So we wrote factors that affect the rate of diffusion. So uh, I've listed the difference in concentration, the size of the molecule, whether it's lipid-soluble or a water-soluble chemical, and the fourth factor is temperature. Let me start with the fourth factor, temperature. And we wrote that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion. If we had opened that bottle of perfume and it was a warm room, it would diffuse at a faster rate. If, in the, on the other hand, it was a cold room, it would diffuse at a slower rate. And that's because temperature, or heat, causes atoms and molecules to vibrate and move at a faster speed. Is that why an alternative product is they heat that room to diffuse? Well, maybe. So, uh, the, the uh, a warmer the temperature, the faster atoms and molecules vibrate and move, and therefore diffuse at, uh, at a faster rate. If you cool things down, they move at a slower and slower rate. And uh, you might ask, well, how cold do you have to make it to stop them from moving completely at all? And you actually have to lower the temperature to a temperature known as absolute zero, minus 273 degrees, 273.15 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, you stop all atomic and molecular motion. It's called absolute zero. But any temperature higher than uh, that temperature, uh, it, 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 the higher it is, the faster the rate of diffusion. Now, uh, another thing that I did write, let's look at factor one, is the difference in concentration. To uh, explain this, let's go back to E9. And on page E9, and I know this is kind of messy, so I'm going to walk you through it. All right, all that I did is I drew some pictures here. And I'll show, right now I just drew a picture right here. And I want to just focus on this area right here. Just that area, right here. So it's not a complicated picture. You'd say, what did you draw? I drew two cells. And I drew a whole bunch of, and you can put this any page you want. You know. uh, anyhow, uh, so I drew a high concentration of some chemical on the outside of this cell. And there's zero on the inside. Right below it, I drew another cell with a high concentration of that same chemical on the outside, but there's already some of the chemical inside of it. So our question is this. Which cell, in which cell, the top picture or the lower picture, would the chemical diffuse at a faster rate? The top one. Because the bigger the difference in concentration, the faster the rate of diffusion. When there's a bigger difference in concentration, in other words, if you open that bottle of perfume and initially all of the perfume is in the bottle and none of it is in the